Hi, everyone. You're watching a video of a discussion hosted by the Political Education Committee of Lower Manhattan Branch in the New York City DSA chapter, where we spoke with Adana Usmani on his essay, The Origins of Mass Incarceration. My name is Carissa. I'm the outgoing chair of this committee, and I'm also the host of this event. I wanted to say before we get into the video that the purpose in us hosting this event uh, is to in interrogate the prevailing theories of the day in the same spirit that Marx implored in his essay for a ruthless criticism of everything existing, where he called on us to be ruthless in two senses. One, that our criticism must not be afraid of its own conclusions, nor of, the co of conflict with the powers that be. This is for the purpose that we clarify to the dogmatic and clarify to ourselves the meanings of our own positions. We really couldn't have found anyone better prepared to do that for us tonight than a donor. So we hope that you enjoy this discussion as much as we enjoyed hosting it. And we'd love to hear what you think. So leave a comment, a question, um, like this video, share it with your friends. Um, and, you know, let us know. It's a real pleasure to be here. And thanks, Krista, for that very arousing introduction. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to make one meta point along those lines before I start, which is that I think in, in the next 45 minutes or so, 40 minutes or so, I'm probably going to throw some stats and numbers at you that you'll find surprising. So if I make a reference to something that makes you think like, nah, there's no way that's true whether it's a number or an argument or something, make a note. I put slide numbers on the slides that I'm about to show you. Ask about it in the Q&A. And if you don't get a chance in the Q&A, make sure to send an email to me and I'm happy to share sources for the readings, reasoning, whatever. Um, I say this because I want it to be clear that to me, political education doesn't mean that you swallow everything that I say. If something's not convincing, really, I mean, please, please do ask me about it. I really do mean that. These aren't simple issues, they're complicated issues. And so there's nothing more important than debating and discussing them until we understand them. So with that said, let me though say something that is simple and that isn't complicated at all, which is that American mass incarceration is, I think of it as kind of like a epoch defining injustice for us. After having especially lived through this summer's events, I think no one needs reminding that the way that America does criminal justice is utterly world historically barbaric. And so it's long, long overdue for fundamental reform. That's why I study it. That's why I write about it. And this is why I was excited to speak about it to you today. That's no doubt why you're here also at this session. But the critical point, obviously, for all of us, as Carissa was saying, is that if, if you want to change the world, as all of us do, we have to make sure that we're interpreting it correctly first. We have to understand mass incarceration if we want to dismantle it. So in that spirit, I want to do four things in this talk. First, I want to say a little bit about what it means to study mass incarceration as a social problem. To understand mass incarceration, I'm going to say, I'm going to argue to you to understand mass incarceration is to answer three kinds of puzzles about American punishment. What changed in America over time? Why is America so different from other countries? And why is American punishment so unequal across America, uh, the American population? Now, I'm, just note that throughout this talk, I'm not going to be saying very much about policing specifically. Mostly when I'm referring to mass incarceration, I'm going to be talking about the severity and inequality of imprisonment in the United States. But the issues are related and policing has particularly been on people's radar. So sometimes I am going to speak about policing and I encourage you to ask me more about it in the Q&A. The second thing I'd like to do after having outlined what it is that we need to understand when we say we want to understand mass incarceration is that I'd like to say a little bit about how it's often misunderstood. I'm going to outline some misconceptions that commonly circulate about mass incarceration. And these are misconceptions that circulate commonly, especially on the left, uh, especially on the left, but not just on the left. The third thing I'm going to do is having dismissed these misconceptions and used their dismissal as an opportunity to establish some facts about American punishment. 
I'm going to offer you my own account of mass incarceration of the various puzzles that I've outlined at the beginning. The longer, fuller version of this argument is in the Catalyst essay that Carissa was referring to. Some of you might have read that before this session. I'm going to try and summarize it, um, but I'm, I'm very happy to speak about it in more detail in the Q&A if you'd like as well. And then the final thing I'll do, and I'm not sure I'm going to get to this in time, so I might skim through it and we can talk about it in the Q&A. I want to say a little bit about what follows for people who want to, people who are plotting to take down the carceral state, for criminal justice reformers and for socialists in particular. What should we, we be thinking about as we plot our efforts around criminal justice reform? So first, let's talk a little bit about what is mass incarceration? What does it mean to try and explain mass incarceration? As I was saying, it, it amounts to three kinds of puzzles about punishment in the US. And what I mean by this is really that any account that we give of American punishment should be able to explain these different puzzles. That's what we're after. And that's what I'm going to try and give you in this talk. If you offer an account, or, or if one offers an account that can explain one of these puzzles or two of these puzzles, but not all three of these puzzles, I'm going to propose to you that that should be considered a weakness of that account. And I'll have much more to say about this as we go along. It'll become more concrete as I present what these puzzles are. So the first puzzle, as I was saying earlier, is what changed over time? So this is a graph that everyone has seen of the incarceration rate in the United States. In the early to mid 20th century, the US incarcerated roughly about as many people as are, as are incarcerated in developed countries today in the rest of the developed world, about 100, 150, 150 to 200 per 100,000. But in the 1970s, something dramatic happened in American punishment and the rate skyrocketed. Everyone has seen this graph. Everyone knows that this has happened. So the first puzzle is why, what happened in the United States? A second puzzle is a cross national puzzle and it's kind of contained in what I just said to you, but it's worth making explicit. What explains why the US is so different from other countries, other developed countries, but also just the rest of the world. So this graph takes a little explaining. It's a little weird, but basically, where the blob is wider, more countries are located. So most developed countries, as I was saying earlier, are around 100 per 100,000. They have about 100 prisoners per 100,000 people. The rest of the world is a little bit more spread out, but roughly the average is similar. The US is an outlier, right? The US has more people in prison per capita than any other country in the world. So that's a puzzle. How do we explain that? Why is the US so different? Finally, there's the puzzle of inequality and exposure to punishment across the American population. So in part, in large part, this is a puzzle about racial inequality. Right? African Americans are about five to seven times more likely to be in prison than white Americans. That's been consistently true over the course of the last several decades of American history. This graph is just one of many graphs that I'm sure you've seen that illustrate this point. This graph focuses on young men who are aged 18 to 50 for reasons that I can explain if you want. They're kind of boring reasons that have to do with the data source. But one point that I would like to make to you is that it's wrong to identify mass incarceration simply with racial disparities. Racial disparities are a very important part of what mass incarceration is, but they don't exhaust the kind of inequality that mass incarceration represents. And that's because class disparities are also very, very profound. And here I can also speak more about this if you'd like, but here I'm using educational attainment as an indicator of class position. Again, for data reasons that I can explain in the Q&A if you're, if you're interested. So this graph also shows very pronounced class disparities in exposure to punishment. Now, you can set these race and class disparities side by side. And what you see is that both of these disparities are an important part of the inequality that any account of mass incarceration has to explain. And I want to explain what I mean by that in a little bit more detail. So first, when you control for class, you see important, significant racial disparities. If you focus on the bars on the left, you see that black high school dropouts are significantly more likely to be in prison than white high school dropouts. So in that sense, class does not explain race. When you control for class, you still see racial disparity. The second point, though, is that when you control for race, you still see class disparities, right? So black high school dropouts are much more likely to be in prison than black college graduates. The reason I want to 
speak about this in a little detail is because sometimes when people discuss these issues, they get hung up on trying to argue whether class or race is more important. Those who think that class is more important will say things like, well, look at Adonir's graph. A white high school dropout is 15 times more likely to be in prison than a black college graduate. You can't really tell that from the numbers here because they're really small, but that statistic is roughly correct. A white high school dropout, 15 times more likely to be in prison than a black college graduate. Those who think that race is more important will cite the first disparity that I was mentioning earlier, the disparity between black high school dropouts and white high school dropouts or black college graduates and white college graduates. My suggestion to you is that you try not to think about this problem in terms of a horse race between race and class. This can, this, this can be more confusing. This is more confusing than helpful. The way to think about what I'm showing you here is to realize that what we need is an account of mass incarceration that can explain all of these facts together. An account that can explain only racial disparities is no use to us. An account that can explain only class disparities is also not useful to us. Today and what follows, I'm gonna try and offer you an account that can explain both. Let me say one last thing about these inequalities and then I'm gonna to move to discussing some misconceptions. So you might not find it so surprising that we see these kinds of race and class patterns in incarceration, um, because obviously to put someone in prison, the state needs to arrest, charge, convict, and sentence that person. So this involves decisions by legislators, police, prosecutors, judges, juries, parole boards, the whole nine yards. And you might doubt the ability of these actors kind of to coordinate a conspiracy to imprison only black people. And so you might say, okay, it makes sense that racial disparities here, that sorry, that disparities here are not simply racial, but you might say the first stage of this process, policing is destined to surely looks different. So you might argue like, in other words, because the burden of proof for arresting someone is so low, because police officers in the United States have so much discretion in whom they choose to target, what kind of behavior they can target or ignore, we might expect racial biases at the first stage to be much, much more extreme. In other words, at the stage of policing, to be much, much more extreme than the racial disparities that you see on this graph. Surprisingly, this doesn't really seem to be the case if you look at current data in the United States. So here is exactly the same kind of race and class graph, but plotting the probability that a young man has ever been arrested, a young man of basically current generation. So this, these are people born between 1979 and 1988, I believe. A young man in that birth court has ever been arrested. And this is taken from a nationally representative panel of American adults called the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. I can speak much more about data sources if you're interested later. So this is that graph, exact same graph, but in the probability that someone has ever been arrested. Again, you see racial disparities. So specifically amongst poor men here, 64% of black high school dropouts report having been arrested, about 57% of white high school dropouts. But you also see very large class disparities. Only about a quarter of college graduates of either race report ever having been arrested. Put these patterns together and you see that even in the case of the probability of having been arrested, white high school dropouts are about 2.5 to three times more likely to have been arrested than black college graduates. Now I should say, and I'm happy to speak more about this, these data are not perfect for reasons that I can talk more about. My guess is that they understate racial disparities a little bit but they're not likely to be off by very much. And I would guess that you find that surprising. I first made this graph for the first time about two years ago. And when I did, I found it so surprising that I actually kind of ignored it. But I've now seen the same pattern in three or four different data sets. So my guess is that it is in fact real. I wanna just comment on why it's so surprising to us if it is in fact real. What explains the clash between the patterns that you see here? And specifically, I'm talking about the, the the class cross race patterns here and the narrative about policing with which all of us are so familiar. One possible explanation that I want to suggest to you, and I'm happy to hear more about what you think about this, but one possible explanation for why this graph seems so surprising to so many of us is that many of us tend to think of policing as very, very and exclusively racialized because most of us actually live in places where it is exclusively racialized. For the most part, DSA members, live in places where the poor and working class are mostly non-white and mostly immigrant. And in these areas, if you look at racial disparities in policing, they're extremely, extremely pronounced. What I'd like you to try and remember though, as we go through this talk is that patterns in 
places where DSA members concentrate are not always going to be representative of the rest of the country demographically. And what we're looking for in an attempt to explain mass incarceration is an explanation of the facts as they are in the entire country and not simply the facts as they appear to us where we live. But this is something I'm sure that we'd like, we'll, we'll talk more about in the discussion. So let me move now to talking about misconceptions. I gave you three kinds of puzzles that an account of mass incarceration has to try and explain. Overtime puzzle, a cross-national puzzle, and an inequality puzzle, a race cross-class inequality puzzle. Let me now talk about seven misconceptions about mass incarceration in the US. Doing this, as I was saying earlier, this will help us delimit plausible explanations of mass incarceration. We want our account of mass incarceration to not fall prey to any of these myths. So the first misconception or myth is the idea that trends in incarceration bear no relationship to trends in crime or violence. To prove this argument, this is an argument that you hear all of the time. And to prove this kind of argument, you'll often see this graph. This is a graph that plots the incarceration rate and the crime rates from 1990 to the present. And if you study this graph, you're very likely to confer, con conclude, to infer that there's no relationship between the two, that these two things are two trends passing in the night. But there are at least two mistakes with inferring that crime is unrelated to incarceration based just on this graph. The first issue is that this graph starts in 1990, which actually ends up being very misleading. So if you start the graph of violent crime and lethal violence earlier in the 1960s, this graph starts to look very different. In fact, what you see is that violent crime and um, lethal violence in particular, although that's not plotted on this graph, rose dramatically in the 1960s and 1970s. And soon after it rose dramatically, the incarceration rate began to increase as well. The second thing that is at issue here is that the comparison of the crime rate and the incarceration rate is actually kind of a comparison of apples to oranges. It's a comparison of what's called a stock to a flow. So the, uh, the incarceration rate measures both past and present incarcerations, while the crime rate is a measure of present crime, crime that's happening in a, in, in a given year. So in, instead, actually, criminologists argue that the right thing to compare here is the change in the incarceration rate and the crime rate. And if you do that, there's actually a much more obvious relationship between the two quantities. Now, here I want to be very clear. None of this is to argue that the rate of crime simply determines the rate of incarceration. There are a lot of other things that figure, and most of what I'm going to talk to you about today is going to try and put flesh on what those other things are. But it is to argue that people are wrong to argue that there's no relationship between crime and incarceration. What, I'm, what I want to argue to you and what I'm going to argue to you as we go further is that the rise in crime and violence was a necessary condition for the rise in punishment, even though it wasn't a sufficient condition. And I'll try and explain what that means going forward. A second myth about the general, a second myth that generally circulates in discussions of mass incarceration is the idea that the public's fear of crime is entirely manufactured. That the idea is that the public is taught to panic about crime by politicians or the media, and that their panic is not actually a response to events. So the conventional story about mass incarceration leans on this idea and argues that American society began to panic about crime in the 70s and the 80s, basically because politicians started to use crime in their political rhetoric. The argument, and if any of you are familiar with the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, you'll recognize this argument. The argument in particular is that Southern politicians saw a political opportunity in the South after the civil rights movement to win disaffected white Democrats by using the rhetoric of law and order. And it's this that the, the argument goes that starts to explain why the public started to panic and then eventually why we got mass incarceration. Now, I think this argument is mistaken. First, our best data, and I'm gonna show you a graph that suggests this, our best data suggests that it's actually, it wasn't just white Southerners, but everyone in the United States, whites in the North and black Americans in general who turned punitive and anxious about crime over this period. I can speak more about where these data come from, but this is some of my own research that takes stock of public opinion polls from the 1950s to the present. In total, this represents about 300,000 Americans who were interviewed for, about criminal justice issues. The second thing to notice here is that there isn't much evidence that 
the rise in American punitiveness, actually, so this isn't clear from the graph, but what this plots is the level of punitiveness, basically. There's not much evidence that the level of punitiveness was a reaction to the civil rights movement in the sense that the peak of punitiveness actually doesn't coincide with the peak of the civil rights movement. In fact, what it coincides with much better is the changes in the level of violence and crime in the United States. Punitiveness wasn't actually an abrupt reaction to events in the late 60s, as the traditional story goes, but it's a gradual reaction which peaks in the 90s, which is around the time that the crime rate also peaked. A third misconception is the idea that mass incarceration was built by the few to control the many. So it's very, very common to hear that mass incarceration was, was a project of the American elite in order to control either black Americans or poor Americans or both. Now, I wanna be very clear about what I mean when I say this is a misconception. There is no doubt that mass incarceration has the effect of socially controlling the poor and racial minorities. But arguing that it has this effect is different from showing that it was built with this intention. And that's an important distinction. There are two major problems with the argument that mass incarceration was built by a handful of elites. First, traditionally in the conventional stories that we tell about mass incarceration, the key protagonists are presidents, right? It's a story about Nixon, it's a story about Reagan, or it's a story about their administrations. But in fact, Almost all of the relevant policies that became mass incarceration were made at the state and local levels, not at the federal level. State and local governments house about 80% of prisoners. They spend about 80% of the money on prisons. And this is only more true in the case of police. So I, I, this doesn't exactly mean that there was no federal inspiration in the punitive turn in American criminal justice policy, but mass incarceration is, is more a story of kind of 50, in other words, states or even 3,000 counties moving in tandem rather than the story of one or two evil figures in America's highest office. The other problem with this argument, with the idea that mass incarceration was built by elites to control the many, is in fact that one of the atypical features of American criminal justice is not the absence of democracy, but actually the pervasiveness of democracy in criminal justice. Now, this should sound really strange to you, given what we know about how American democracy operates. But let me just explain what I mean by this. Unlike other European countries, American electorates actually have quite a lot of say in criminal justice outcomes. Juries make important decisions. Judges, prosecutors, police chiefs are elected or appointed by elected officials, whereas in Europe, they're mostly unelected civil servants. And elected officials and state legislatures have much wider say over criminal justice law than elsewhere. Lots of academics argue that this exceptionally democratic nature helps explain America's exceptionally harsh criminal justice system. Now, I'm going to reject that argument in what follows, but you do have to take stock of the fact that America is, in fact, quite democratic in its criminal justice in the way that it organizes criminal justice. The point here is just that the story of mass incarceration, as actually with the story of so much injustice in our world, is much, much more sobering than a story of conniving, powerful people who want to control minorities in the poor. It's a complicated story, which doesn't mean it's not scandalous, which doesn't mean it's not unjust, but it just means it's a different story than the simple stories we sometimes tell. A fourth myth that I want to address is the idea that the war on drugs is what gave us mass incarceration. So if you have a casual conversation with a relative about why America has the gulags that we have, the standard answer is usually, well, we've criminalized the usage of drugs, a behavior that someone might add that we ignore in white communities, but police and uh, police and use for pretext of incarceration in black and brown communities. America has a high incarceration rate, therefore, and it has racial inequalities because of the rate at which it incarcerates nonviolent, low level drug offenders. But the difficulty for this argument is that only about 20 to 25% of the prison and jail population are drug offenders. If you were to eliminate drug offenders, the US would still be an international outlier. And actually, even more of a problem is that of that 20 to 25 percent, only a very, very small minority, perhaps as low as 5 percent of that 20 percent, are the kinds of offenders that are at the center of the conventional story. Nonviolent, low-level drug offenders with no ties to the drug trade. People whose only crime was to use a banned substance. This doesn't mean that the rest of the people in prison are kingpins. Actually, kingpins really, like drug kingpins, very rarely go to prison. But most people are somewhere in the middle, involved in the drug trade and have some kind of violent criminal history. So in short, this is not a story about the war on drugs, at least as conventionally 
told. A fifth misconception is the idea that mass incarceration has not reduced crime. Now, you'll often hear reformers argue that, look, mass incarceration, it's not just morally abhorrent, as I've been arguing to you, but it's also ineffective in its stated aims. That is, it doesn't have the effect of reducing crime and violence. There are some challenges in estimating the effect of, crime, of incarceration and policing here, I'm gonna to add to the mix on crime. And that's because obviously crime affects policing and incarceration just as incarceration policing affect crime. So you can't simply look at correlations. You have to try and study this in a causal way, which is quite challenging. But most of the current literature on this topic suggests that our best estimates are that the number of police on the streets and the number of prisoners have negative effects on crime. Now, many of you will have heard something very different from some people who've been talking about this issue recently. Alex Vitali, for instance, the author of The End of Policing, has been arguing the opposite in recent months and in his book. But just to put it bluntly, my view is basically that he's wrong about the literature. A very good, thoughtful review of this topic is in Patrick Sharkey's recent book, who's a sociologist at Princeton, titled Uneasy Peace. That's a great read on what's happened over the last 20 years in American criminal justice and crime. The conclusion basically is that a significant part of the decline in crime in the 90s and the 2000s, not all of it, but not none of it, is probably explained by the rise in incarceration and the increase in policing, the rise of the carceral state. Now here I wanna be very, very clear about something. And this is a kind of distinction that I'm gonna try and draw as we keep going. This fact that incarceration and policing may have led to a decline in crime, this fact says nothing about whether or not mass incarceration or policing are justified. So my, the example that I use with undergrads when I talk about this is to, to make this distinction clear is that, you know, if tomorrow America started executing people for double parking, day after tomorrow, a lot fewer people would be double parking. But no one would argue that executions for double parking would be justified. And something similar is true of mass incarceration. A sixth myth, and here is a, this is a myth that I'd like to spend a little bit of time unpacking because it's something that has circulated a lot recently, is the idea that mass incarceration is expensive. So you often hear that the US spends an enormous amount of money locking up offenders and policing America's streets. And if only we could put that money towards education, housing, healthcare, welfare, it would solve all of the problems that prisons and police don't solve. These kinds of arguments were very common this summer as demands to defund the police took off. And they've long, long been very common actually in reform circles. So many of you will have heard this statistic that we spend $40,000 per year per prisoner, only $10,000 per kid who goes to elementary school. The very, very common argument that criminal justice reformers make. I wanna address this in some detail. Now it is in fact roughly true that we spend about $40,000 per prisoner and only $10,000 per kid in elementary school. Yet while this fact about per capita expenditure is correct, the inference that prisons and police are more expensive is wrong. So let me explain how this can be. The simple reason is that the per capita comparison is really, really misleading. Mass incarceration is not a program that targets all poor people for all of their life. It's actually hyper-targeted in two senses. First, police arrest a small fraction of the American public in total, about 15% of Americans report having been arrested at least once in their life. Prosecutors will charge an even smaller fraction of that. Prisons harbor an even smaller fraction of that. At any given point in time, prisons harbor about 1% of the American population. The second thing that makes it hyper-targeted is that contact with the criminal justice system is typically occasional over the life course. It's concentrated in young adulthood and it's concentrated amongst young men in particular. If you contrast that to social programs, social programs are actually indiscriminate. They go to all people, many go to all people, and others go at least to all poor people. And they go to all these people for large substantial chunks of their life. That's what this kind of ugly graph is supposed to show. So the result of this is that if you, if you put all of this together, US spending on prisons and police is actually dwarfed by spending on social programs. The U.S. spends around 250 to 300 billion dollars at all levels of government on courts, prisons, and the police. Depending on your estimates, it's up to 12 times that that the United States spends on social programs. Put another way, and here is it. I'm going to show you a graph that represents this exact same idea in a different way, with it broken down by category. America spends about 
about $1,000 per person per year on prisons, police, and the courts. And it spends about five to $13,000, depending on how you count again, on social policies of various kinds. The reason that I say that it's five to 13,000 uh, roughly, although actually it doesn't go up to 13 here, is that some of this money goes to the middle class and the elderly, right? So it's not really a fair comparison. It's not all being spent on the poor. But even money targeted just at poor people is significantly larger than the money that we spend at prisons and police. If you count just means tested programs, so just programs that test for a person's poverty status, those add up to about $1 trillion, which is about four times the carceral state. And that excludes all of the money from universal programs that goes to poor people, like social security or something like that. The overall point here, which is gonna be very, very important to the story I'm gonna tell you in a second about why we have mass incarceration, is that mass incarceration, you should think of mass incarceration as crime control on the cheap. In one sense, this is actually the kind of thing that defund advocates were arguing this summer, right? We use prisons and not social policy, and we should use social policy to handle the problems that we throw uh, prisons and police at. And I co-signed that part of the argument wholeheartedly. But in another sense, these facts point to some of the limits of the defend argument, in my view, which relied a lot on the idea that we can take this bar on the left and move it to the right and have a, a social democratic, even socialist future. And I wanna explain a little bit why that's misleading. If you take the, if you, if you assume for a second, I, I guess you can actually see it in these figures, but let me just put the numbers on it. So if the numbers here are roughly right, even if you totally abolished prisons, police, and the courts, that would generate no more than a five to 10% increase in social spending. The, the gap between the United States and social democratic countries in Europe is roughly estimated at around 10% of GDP, which is about $2 trillion or $2,000 billion. That's roughly six to seven times what we spend on police, prisons, and courts. So if you take all of the money on the left you'd, and move it to social policy, you'd, uh, you'd close only about 10 to 15% of the gap to social democratic countries in Europe. And social democratic countries in Europe are not paradises. We want more than that, right? We're, we're, we're not here to demand social democracy. We're here to demand much more. So in that sense, this, is, this way of thinking about the problem is really limited, I'd like to suggest to you. Now, one thing you might be wondering is, well, Adani, okay, if you're right, what explains statistics like this one? So you have seen people make arguments like this a lot, right? City governments spend 30% of their budgets on policing, right? Today, this is a piece by Kianga Yamada Taylor, Chicago, Oakland, Houston, Minneapolis, Orlando, Detroit, spend at least 30% of their general fund on their police departments. Isn't that proof that we're actually funding police and ignoring other services? So I, can, I, I actually wanna make this point a little bit more forceful in order, forceful in order to show you what's wrong with this statistics. So if you look at the numbers in a certain light, this is in fact what you see. So here's a graph showing local government spending per capita. So the United States is divided into three levels, right? The local, there's a local government, state government, federal government, and they divide responsibilities for spending. When this piece, Kianga's piece, cites city government budgets, what it's looking at is local government spending. So here's a graph of local government spending across the United States split into penal and social spending. And you see, in fact, that local governments spend more money on police, prisons, and the courts than they do on welfare. How can that be true, given what I was arguing earlier? The simple reason is that this kind of presentation of the statistics is kind of an, a little bit of an accounting trick because it ignores the way in which America divides responsibility between state, local, and federal governments. The federal government is responsible for the lion's share of social spending and local governments are responsible for most of penal spending while state governments kind of mix, they do a little bit of both. So this is what it looks like if you look just at federal and state governments. So the previous graph was local governments. Now it's ignoring local governments looking at federal and state governments. And you see that that inverts the picture entirely because priorities at that level, those levels of government are very different. The graph that I showed you at the beginning is actually just this graph plus this graph together. And what you see when you put them together is the picture that I was showing you earlier, the original graph. A neat way of summarizing this, or not a neat way of summarizing this, but a simple way of summarizing this is to say that 
even while it is entirely correct to say that New York City spends less on healthcare than it spends on policing, it's not correct to say that more money is spent in New York City on healthcare than on policing. And that's because the federal and state governments actually do a lot of that spending. That's basically the issue here. So that local government statistic in the end ends up being quite misleading with regards to the overall balance of social and penal spending in the United States. That's the point that I wanted to make to you. The final misconception that I wanted to talk about and address is the idea that racial disparities in incarceration are explained by explicit or implicit bias of police, prosecutors, judges, or juries. Now, it shouldn't be a surprise to any of us, any of you, any of us, that there is differential treatment in the criminal justice system. Similarly situated black and white individuals are treated differently. There's lots of social science evidence of this. One example is that federal data, and it's actually kind of difficult to get a single estimate because the federal data and the state data are, are uh, separate um, and the state data aren't really as good. But so people looking at federal data have shown that black offenders are usually sentenced to sentences that are 25% longer than similar white offenders. So you control for crime, you control for criminal background, you control for all of the things that you can observe. And you see that even still, black offenders are sentenced to sentences that are 25% longer than white offenders. So there is very clearly racism inside the criminal justice system in the sense of differential treatment. But to note that there is racism is not to have shown how much of the total disparity is explained by that kind of racism. And this is really the critical point. So let me work with this example. 25% greater sentence length sounds very, very large. But remember that what we're trying to explain is actually a 500% disparity, right? We're trying to explain a five to one disparity in black and white incarceration. And another way of putting the same two facts is that racism in sentencing explains only 5% of the total racial disparity. That's 25 divided by 500, which is 5%. Now, to be very, very clear, racism in the sense of differential treatment at different stages of the criminal justice system is obviously not just limited to how judges sentence offenders, but it's also about how police treat people that they might arrest, how prosecutors charge people that they have been arrested, how juries convict, and then how judges sentence, right? There are many, many different stages at which racism can make itself felt. But our best evidence from criminologists suggests that most of the racial disparity in incarceration is not explained by differential treatment at these stages, but it's explained by the fact that African Americans are more likely to commit crime than white Americans. About 70 to 75% of the total disparity in rates of incarceration can be explained by disparities in crime commission. Now, this isn't easy to estimate because the police behave in racially biased ways, but I can explain how criminologists try and get around this. I just wanna be very, very clear about what follows from this. People tend to be wary of this argument because they think that noting this argument justifies racial disparities in punishment. But this is to confuse a moral judgment with an empirical fact. And it's therefore to make a kind of category error in reasoning. Observing the fact of racial disparities in crime commission does not commit you to victim blaming or to supporting mass incarceration. In fact, my view is that to have argued that most of the racial disparity in incarceration is explained by racial disparities in offending is actually just to have raised another question. What explains racial disparities in offending? And here there's a lot of scholarship that offers a very good answer. African Americans are more likely to be involved in violence in the United States because they're more likely to be oppressed. They're more likely to live in America's worst, most segregated neighborhoods at the bottom of its class structure and with few opportunities to escape. So in that sense, crime is an index of oppression. Violence is an index of oppression. And if you agree with me that high rates of crime are in fact due to racial inequality in life circumstances, my view is that it's basically preposterous to hold people or racial groups to blame. And even more difficult to go one step further and argue that somehow racial disparities in punishment are therefore justified. The right argument for socialists to make is that the state and the system we live under are responsible. High levels of violence are a sign of a society in disrepair. They're not a sign of evil people freely making blameworthy decisions. When socialists worry that that is what follow, I'd like you to note that we're kind of accepting the moral reasoning that conservatives usually use, right? Conservatives, it is conservatives who think that noting that people commit crime also requires you to blame them. But that's a logic that socialists should reject. And that's something that I'm happy to speak more about in the Q&A.
Okay, so that was seven misconceptions. So just to review, I've said seven things in response to those misconceptions. I've said first, crime did in fact increase. Second, public fear of crime actually responded to this increase. Third, I said that American criminal justice is actually in some ways exceptionally democratic, not exceptionally in the moral sense, like exceptionally good, but exceptionally in the sense that it's very different from other countries. And that mass incarceration was made by state and local officials, not by Nixon, Reagan, and key figures at the federal level. A fourth thing I've said is that it's not about the war on drugs. A fifth thing I've said is that mass incarceration and policing have probably had a negative effect on crime. A sixth thing I've said is that mass incarceration is not expensive, but actually a remarkably cheap way of managing social disorder. And the final thing I've said is that racial disparities are mostly the result of racial inequality and in life circumstances of racial oppression rather than differential treatment by actors in the criminal justice system. The point of all of that was to say that these are seven things that answers to the puzzles that I outlined at the beginning must take seriously. So having noted these seven things and having talked about the puzzles in a little bit of detail at the beginning, I'm kind of now in a place to offer my own account of, the, of those puzzles uh, that I presented at the outset. So those puzzles, just to remind you, were why did mass incarceration arise? Where did it come from? Why, did it, why was there this dramatic change in the 1970s? Why in the United States? Why is the US so different from other countries? And finally, what explains differential exposure to the carceral state by class and by race? So let's start with why did mass incarceration emerge? What changed? Well, the first thing to note is that over the 20th century, violence in the United States rose to remarkably high levels by international standards. So this is a graph might take a little bit of explaining, but this is a graph that basically shows the ratio of the homicide rate in the United States to the homicide rate in all other developed countries for which we have data. And you can see actually, interestingly, in 1900, the US was not an exceptionally violent country. And that was actually true prior to 1900 as well, as far as we can tell. But the course of development in the, in the US in the 20th century has been totally different than other European countries. In 1975, which is around when this line peaks, the US was about 10 times more violent by homicide rate than the median rate in developed countries. And it's been about five to 10 times as violent for most of the 20th century. The catalyst piece that Carissa referenced tries to give an account of this rise in violence. I'm not gonna be able to speak about it in full detail. I really encourage you to read the piece and see what you think of the explanation that we offer. But the short version is that America's development path was unique amongst advanced capitalist countries. And that's basically the single sentence summary of that is that the United States, unlike the United States, very unlike European countries, industrialized with the peasantry of other countries rather than its own. What happened in effect over the course of the 20th century was that African Americans were trapped in the Southern plantation economy. And they thus arrived late in American cities once jobs and public goods were already hoarded by established white ethnics. By the mid, by the 1960s, so they're already sort of at the, at the bottom of the labor market and living in the worst, most neglected neighborhoods in American cities. And by the 1960s, white and middle-class people start to leave cities and jobs start to leave cities. This is a story of deindustrialization. This is the context, context for the rise in crime and violence. These broad facts about American economic development. Now, in reaction to that rise in violence, by the 1960s, as I showed you earlier, the American public, both black and white, started to react to this rise in violence with alarm. They demanded that politicians do something about this rise in violence. Now, it's very important to note for us as socialists that their demands were not simply punitive. There is pretty good evidence that the public supported what are called all of the above strategies to deal with crime. So a good book on this is James Foreman Jr.'s Pulitzer Prize winner book called Locking Up Our Own, titled Locking Up Our Own, which argues that the black community in Washington, DC, this, this book is about the black community in Washington, DC, demanded jobs, education, as well as punitive policies in response to the rise in crime. But these demands were deformed by the realities of the political and economic system that we have in the United States. This is my argument to you. To be very clear, what I mean by this relates to what I was arguing earlier about the relative expense of a social democratic assault on the root causes of crime. 
social policy, what I was calling earlier social policy. Fighting crime at its roots would have required a dramatic expansion of America's welfare state. It would have required taking from rich people in rich places and giving to poor people in poor places. At times in American politics, this has been mooted. So in the 1960s, the kind of great society government did speak about crime in these terms, in structural terms, and argued that we ought to have a root causes approach. But basically, over the course of the 20th century, this approach to social problems in the United States basically failed. The way that I would make sense of this, and I'll say a little bit more about this in just a second, the simple explanation of this is, it's because, is that it's because of the long running constraints on American politics. The absence of a powerful working class movement, the absence of a social democratic party, which all have put together has meant that state elites basically couldn't be forced to concede money by taxation and redistribution. And this next graph that I'm gonna show you illustrates that as well as any. So this is a graph of social spending, social transfers. You can think of them as social transfers from rich to poor in the United States as compared to all other developed countries. And you can see that the United States has long been a welfare laggard. Basically around 1890, the United States wasn't that distinct from the rest of the advanced capitalist world. But over the course of the 20th century, America's welfare state has not expanded in step. And sometimes we tell this as, as a story about what happened in the 1930s or what happened in the 1960s, things could have been different. But really what I want you to appreciate before we have the argument about what could have been different, what I want you to appreciate is this is an enduring fact of American political development. This characterizes the entirety of the 20th century. And in that sense, it, we're, when we're trying to explain this, we're looking for an explanation that is deep in the fabric of American political and economic development. And I'm gonna try and offer you that in a second. So just to summarize, what, what explains the rise in mass incarceration? What explains it in my view is basically that there was no social democratic party or constituency in American politics to win the massive redistribution that could have averted the rise in violence before it happened or addressed it after it had happened with a suite of social democratic policy, with social policy. That was the first puzzle, and I'm happy to elaborate a little bit wherever you see holes, I'm happy to try and address them. Let me now talk about the second puzzle, because what I argued to you at the beginning was that any account we give of mass incarceration should be able to explain all of the puzzles that are involved. A strength of the account that I have just given you is that the answer to the second puzzle that I raised, which is why the United States, why American exceptionalism, kind of follows naturally from the first answer that I just gave you. America has mass incarceration because America is the only country in the advanced world with such anemic, pathetic levels of redistribution from rich people in rich places to poor people in poor places. You might think of this as encompassing two facts about America. You can think of an institutional fact and a political fact. The political fact is one that I've already mentioned, but so let me say the, let me mention the institutional fact first. First, America has unique difficulties redistributing from rich places to poor places. One way of thinking about that is that state and local property rights are overdeveloped vis-a-vis -vis the federal government. And this is sometimes referred to as uh, the problem of American federalism. The second fact about America that's important here, and this is what I was just talking about earlier, and what's very important for us in the DSA, is that America is the only advanced country without a meaningful social democratic political party. And in that sense, partly the puzzle of American mass incarceration runs through the puzzle of no American socialism. What I'd like to observe here is that this, in my view, these two facts, this institutional fact and this political fact, these give us a way of thinking about the relationship between slavery and mass incarceration that is more useful than the way in which you will conventionally hear the two things related. So the conventional standard argument is that American slavery explains American mass incarceration because American slavery gave birth to an ideology of white supremacy. And this ideology of white supremacy explains why we have the kind of punishment that we have. This is the kind of thing that you have seen in Michelle Alexander's book to some extent, also obviously in the uh, movie 13th, which has been quite widely distributed. If you accept what I've argued so far today, you should already be a little suspicious of that argument for several reasons, right? It has no, that kind of argument has no explanation for many of the facts that I've presented. And it's guilty of many of the myths that I've tried to emphasize to you or mis misconceptions. But I do want to emphasize that the argument 
is not wrong to observe that there is a very profound link between American slavery and American mass incarceration. But that link, in my view, runs not through what slavery did to American ideology or American culture, but through the ways in which American slavery deformed American economic and political development. So both of these two things that I said make America different, institutional fact and this political fact, both of these can be related directly to the consequences of American slavery. First, the late proletarianization of African Americans, their late arrival to American cities is an excellent explanation for the divided, persistently divided and racist nature of the American labor movement and the American working class. And it's probably, in my view, our best explanation of the weakness of the American labor movement and thus the weakness of American socialism. Slavery is entirely involved then in explaining why we don't have a social democratic political party. And the second thing here, that institutional issue that I had mentioned, is that our best explanation of the persistent underdevelopment of federal authority is actually the power of plantation owners over American government. It's a key reason that the federal government was unable to override state and local property rights and redistribute from some areas to, another, to other areas. There are a couple of great books on this. There's one book titled American Taxation, American Slavery by the historian Robin Einhorn, which makes this kind of argument about income tax in particular. And then there's a recent book that just came out titled Southern Nation by Ira, Ira Katz Nelson and a couple of co-authors, which makes the argument that over the 1890 to 1930 period, which if you look at this graph actually is kind of the decisive period when America lags behind, that over that period, the power of the Southern plantocracy was extremely pronounced in American government. And they basically waylaid many attempts to expand the American welfare state through their power. And obviously, the story of the New Deal is a, is a story that many of us know, their ability to block key parts of the New Deal and make it less redistributive and more white-centric than it otherwise was. That's, the, that's entirely a story of the power of the plantation elite. So that was the second puzzle, why the US. Finally, let me address the third puzzle, which I think also a strength of my the account that I'm trying to offer you is that it has a natural explanation for the kinds of inequalities that I presented to you. Why do we have racial inequality? Why do we have these kinds of class inequalities? If you agree with what I've tried to argue so far, mass incarceration and its inequalities are basically a story of how America has managed the social disorder that's the result of racial and class oppression. So in other words, racial and class inequalities and incarceration are basically reflections of a society that tries to manage racial and class oppression on the cheap. With regards to racial inequality, as I've tried to emphasize, the explanation should be clear, right? African Americans are overrepresented in the ranks of the victims of American police and imprisonment because they're overrepresented in the ranks of the oppressed as a result of the many consequences of slavery on American development. That would be my explanation for the third puzzle, why inequality? So finally, let me end with talking a little bit about some lessons for reformers. And I'm cognizant of the time. So I initially had five things that I wanted you to think about. I'm not gonna speak about the first four of those because they kind of repeat and just summarize things that I've already said. I'm just gonna end with the fifth and then I'm happy to speak about any of these in discussion if they look interesting. So that's the first, second, third, fourth. And this is the last thing that I want to address before I conclude. The challenge of waging war on inequality in American mass incarceration, and in particular, the challenge of waging war against the racial disparities, the outrageous racial disparities in American punishment, what socialists have to understand is that that challenge is much, much more profound than ending racism and ending bias in the criminal justice system. It's much more profound than implicit bias training for police judges, much more profound challenge than having more black police judges, et cetera, what have you. And the reason that it's much more profound is for the reasons that I gave you earlier, that bias does not actually explain the lion's share of the racial disparity. Now, you can, of course, dispute and debate with me the argument that I've made to you, and I look forward to having that discussion. Um, but don't ignore the facts that I've tried to suggest to you, because if I'm right, if you ignore me and if I'm right, problem for you in, as, a, as a criminal justice activist, as a socialist in the United States, is that you will be, you're going to be doomed to be an ineffective warrior 
against racial disparities in mass incarceration. If you spend your time focusing on undoing racial bias inside the criminal justice system, my provocation to you is that you're gonna be ignoring the much, much more profound challenge and a challenge that falls uniquely, I, guess, I would add to socialists, the much more profound challenge of tackling American racial and class inequality at its root. And that's the profound challenge that socialists have to have in their sights at all times. So let me just end by reminding you of what I've argued to you today. So I said mass incarceration amounts to three puzzles about American punishment. What changed, why the United States, and why racial and class equality. And I've argued that many of the things that you've heard about mass incarceration, and thus the answers that you might yourself have given, to these questions previously are wrong or at least incomplete. I argued kind of in a sentence that mass incarceration is the way that a country without the ability to redistribute from rich to poor reacts to its extensive social problems and the resulting violence. In a sentence, the, un the overdevelopment of American penal policy is a symptom of the underdevelopment of American social policy. So let me leave you with one final thought, which is derivative of this last point. And this is a point that was made to me by uh, NYC DSA member Jeremy Cohen, the first time I ever gave this presentation to a DSA branch. So I'm freely plagiarizing him without his permission. One of the reasons that socialists have a special place in the fight against mass incarceration is, you might argue, because we're kind of primed to think about the injustices of the carceral state. Our values oblige us to do criminal justice reform, to fight for the oppressed, to fight for the downtrodden, to fight for the criminal. There's that famous, beautiful Eugene Debs quote, which many, you, many of you will have heard, right? While there is a soul in prison, I am not free. What I wanna to suggest to you, or what Jeremy wants to suggest to you, is that there is another reason that you as a socialist should commit to the fight for criminal justice reform. It is not simply that as a socialist, you should be committed to criminal justice reform to be a really kind of true to your values socialist. It's really because if you accept the arguments that I've made to you today, even if you just accept some of the arguments that I've made to you today, criminal justice reform urgently needs you. It urgently needs socialists. Because if, if criminal justice reform were the, like the simple matter of retraining police officers, retraining prosecutors, retraining judges, ending the war on drugs and decriminalizing marijuana, redirecting existing revenue from penal to social policy, it could probably be left to liberals and to the political mainstream. But it's not that. If I've convinced you of one thing, let it be this. So criminal justice reform is in fact the much, much more difficult challenge of fighting American class and racial inequality at its root. And for that reason, it desperately needs us. It desperately needs you. It desperately needs the DSA. And that's why I'm very, very happy to speak to you today. <laughs> Thank you, Adana. Um, it's course. always really refreshing to hear uh, your presentations. I think I'm, uh, I've listened to probably all of the interviews that you've given on this topic, um, just in preparation for it. But every time I hear it, it's always, um, I always learn something new. Um, and it, for me, encountering your essay for the first time, it um, kind of brought, shed a light on um, a major, you know, um, facet of that that profoundly impacted my own life growing up um my most of my family uh has encountered the criminal justice system in one way or the other um and it's more of like a, a rule and the exception for someone to not have encountered the criminal justice uh, system in my family um sad to say uh we kind of joke sometimes that um my a lot of my family members could be lawyers themselves just for how much they know about the law and and uh the different levels of um you know uh, uh penal systems like you know state law uh federal law um and um you know i say that in jest but uh it's honestly really a, a really sad reality um my uh father and his generation came of age in the 70s during this era that you speak of um, where deindustrialization de had already kind of made its impact on uh, black communities and communities in general across the country. Um, uh, and for my father being someone who, you know, he, he didn't go on to go to college. Uh, so really all he had was high school diploma to his name and not very much family resources. Um, 
him and his generation turned to illicit activity to make a living um, where, where I grew up in, in Iowa. Um, and my family paid a price for it. He paid a price for it. Um, it, it profoundly impacted, um, you know, not just his generation that went to prison, but the generation that came after that. Um, so that, you know, now my generation, um, you know, there's um, a, a good percentage of us that have been to, to jail or prison or uh, come into contact, like I said. Um, and so encountering your essay, it really kind of brings out the kind of reasons why, or like what led uh, him to his life to that outcome of entering into the criminal justice system and um, uh, you know, ending, ending up in prison when I was a high school um, or a, a senior in high school, um, which was in 2008. And luckily he wasn't uh, there for too long. Um, that he was able to get out on parole. Um, but 10 years later, it has still had a profound impact on his life and he still cannot find stable employment um, or, um, you know, afford, uh, find like housing that is affordable and safe for him to live in. Um, the only thing he has going for him is that he has, he's able to qualify for veterans healthcare. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it occurred to me that if we only really focused on the issue of the criminal justice system and, the, and reforming the criminal justice system, um, sure, he'd have a nicer experience being in prison and away from his family and, I don't know, maybe he'd be less sad being in prison or depressed or whatever, but, um, you know, uh, he would still be in a situation he didn't want to be in, right? And um, we would still have people ending up in a place that uh, was really de is really devastating um, being away from their families. Um, so if we don't deal with the facts that lead people to these kind of um, life outcomes, um, if we don't, you know, deal with the fact that there's uh, a, a devastating, you know, loss of jobs for low skilled workers, uh, that there's very little, you know, healthcare resources, mental health resources for people to deal with mental health addictions, um, then we're, we're only going to make a, or we'll barely really make a dent in the colossal issue that is the mass incarceration uh, system in the U.S. Um, and so, you know, even though this is, that's my own personal anecdote, um, but that does not make me unique. Honestly, you know, we're all harmed by the loss of human potential when it's thrown away in a system that, you know, devours souls. It's really, the, that's kind of the only way that I can uh, think of it. it. It really devours souls and it brings entire families and communities with it. Um, so it's, you know, an, a moral imperative um, but also, you know, one that we should, it's a strategic conundrum and one that we should really take seriously. So I, I really appreciate your, um, your insight into drawing out that, that reality. Um, Thanks, Marissa. So, yeah. yeah. Um, that, was really, that, was, you, that was really, uh, that's, the, that's the most moving thing that anyone has ever said in response to a presentation that I feel like. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's very true. And I, I hope more people can actually hear um, the argument that you're trying to make, um, because I really do think that it, it accounts for a lot more than it denies. Um, so I, I guess in that same um, light of, of um, you know, what it might deny for certain people, um, there are people who will see the, um, this argument that seeks to explain um, more, you know, find more causal explanation for um, mass incarceration beyond racism as downplaying the role of racism. So I'm, I'm curious what you would say to that um, and, you know, why, why you think that that, um, I guess, would be a, a, a mistake in interpretation. Sure, that's a great question. I, I think the way that I would respond to that question is in two parts. So first, I think what we need is a working definition of racism. And I think sometimes the difficulty is that people mean different things by that 
word. So let me propose two different definitions. One definition of racism would be racism in the sense of r racially disparate treatment by agents. Like, so if a, if a judge, for instance, as I was saying earlier, sentences a black man to a longer sentence than he would sentence a comparable white man to, that's racism. Um, that kind of racism, as I was trying to say, definitely exists in the criminal justice system. But we wanna try and understand what share of the total racial inequality is explained by that racism. And our best estimates are like 70 to 75%, as I was saying. But there's another sense sometimes in which people use the word racism, which is sometimes like, sometimes associated with terms like structural racism. Um, I, in this presentation, was using the word racial inequality to talk about that kind of racism, which is the basic fact, as I was saying earlier, as I put it earlier, I think the way that American slavery deformed American political and economic development and has meant that African Americans on average find themselves disproportionately in the ranks of the oppressed. That kind of racism, that is like in, in some ways what I was trying to argue, that is the story of mass incarceration. But it's just important analytically to be clear about what we mean when we use the term racism. If we mean the first thing, that in one sense, racism is actually a pretty limited explanation. It's part of the explanation, but it's a limited explanation. If we mean racism in the second sense, well, that's at the heart, in my view, of the story of how we have mass incarceration. So that's, I think, an important distinction to make. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think um, I would love to hear from anyone in the audience who um, might, you know, agree with uh, the critique of your argument that it, it, it is downplaying um, what they see as the role of racism, um, just to explain more of, of that position. Um, so my next question, and this might be um, more anecdotal um, and, um, uh, relating to my own personal experience, but I hope that it could uh, have some universal application. Because uh, as I was thinking about your argument and the way that it applies to my family, um, I mean, uh, so I'm uh, biracial, so my mother's side is white, my father is black, and um, I had, so most of my father's family has um, experienced uh, the criminal justice system being, um, uh, you know, in jail or prison. Um, but I also have family members on my mother's side who have been in and out of jails or prison since um, they were children. Uh, and when I tried to think about the uh, common thread in both of those stories, um, on the one side of, of, of my dad's family, it's, you know, family that comes from very few resources um, that, you know, was, was poor, struggled, um, migrated from, this, from Arkansas to Iowa um, at, a, uh, I think, in the 50s or 60s. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned earlier, came to um, a, a state with very few jobs for people um, with low skills. And so my generation that did end up committing offenses as youth um, came from, you know, many of their parents who are my aunts and uncles were in prison themselves. Um, and so um, you can see, you know, how the, the, the effect that underwork had on that outcome. But on the other side, um, with my, my grandma and my, my uncle, who I'm thinking about, um, my, my grandma worked two to three jobs most of her life and was a single mother for, you know, most, most of her life and uh, worked extremely hard and eventually had resources. Um, but my uncle still like um, engaged in delinquent behavior as a youth and is now still in prison um, because of uh, an addiction that he developed along the way. Um, and, you know, as, you know, as a result, has very little relationships with anyone in his family. So um, in, in that scenario, uh, there's a condition of overwork. Uh, and I, I see it in the same vein of like this precarity of, of work and the lack of um, being able to just, uh, I guess, relax or, you know, not worry about one's livelihood. Um, and um, 
the, the kind of the impact that that has on, on one's freedom. Uh, so I'm curious from you, and you know, I'm sorry if this goes way beyond your expertise here, or what your research research shows, but I'm just curious. Uh, I can't help but think about the impact of the nature of work uh, and how that affects mass incarceration. This this uh, outcome of mass incarceration. Yeah, that's a really profound point. I haven't thought about it in that way exactly. I think commonly when people think about the employment problems that lead to the kind of complex of issues that we've been discussing. They think entirely about mass unemployment and underwork. But it's interesting, as you're suggesting, to think about the way in which actually the phenomenon of overwork and precarity and insecurity is actually also a feature of the kind of class society in which we live. And in that sense, is also part of the complex of issues that lead uh, a state to deal with social problems in the way that it does. It's not something that I've thought about specifically, but it has some resonance to traditional accounts in kind of Marxist criminology, which look not specifically at unemployment the way that say sociologists and criminologists now do, but just think of the problems that we have as features of class society more generally. That's, I think that's the most, that's the, that's the most insightful thing I can say, even if it's not very insightful. That's how I would relate <laughs> what you just said to the broader literature. But yeah, it's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I was just uh, thinking about this in terms of how do we understand, you know, juvenile behavior or delinquent behavior that leads to, um, uh, you know, these outcomes later in, in life um, of people entering into the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a cycle that's hard to break. Um, and can't be just fully explained or even fixed immediately with providing better jobs. Um, but um, I don't want to trivi trivialize the impact of what having a much better job would be for, uh, for a family. Well, actually, um, that, I mean, and, can I say something about that? Because that's a great point, and that's not something that I think I emphasized enough, which is that you only need to look at how juvenile uh, delinquent behavior is treated in communities with lots of resources to understand that this is broader than simply an issue as you're suggesting of unemployment. And it's about the broader resources that a community has to bring to bear to support people, whether families or young children or whatever else um, through their self-development, right? I mean, like, um, and, and the truth is, and, and this is not, it's, it's an argument that's, a, I think, probably a little far afield from the argument that I was making, but it's something worth discussing is that in general, certain, in, in general, America is just not very forgiving of people who make mistakes, right? And that has, uh, that has, a, that, that fact makes itself felt in the way that we do criminal justice. And sometimes some thing that alarms me a little bit is that sometimes the views of American leftists on criminal justice are actually kind of more American than left wing. We're not, we also tend mm -hmm. to be quite punitive in some of our intuitions. I mean, that is a problem, I think, for us as we think about how to deal with the various problems that are American mass incarceration. Absolutely. But yes, yeah, those are a bunch yeah. of great points. I'll have to think about them. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, what, there was one question that came in to ask if you were expanding this into a book and Given that I've listened to all your interviews, I know that you are, but if you want to say a little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, um, we are. Uh, so John Clegg, who's the co-author, and I are working on a book. The book is going to be a little different than the article. The article was very, was very historical in some sense. It was kind of an account of the United States. But I think one of the things that both of us think is that and it's in line with some of the things I was showing you in the presentation, to really understand the United States, you actually need to study the United States in a broader context, so in comparative and historical context. So we're working on a book collecting data on other countries, on prisons, policing, violence, and the book then will be a kind of comparative account of American incarceration vis-a-vis -vis these other countries. I think there's a lot to learn by looking at other countries. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, okay, I have one more question for you. I hope um, it doesn't take up more time, but I want to, you know, be able to turn it over to other people. Um, but honestly, I could, like, continue asking you questions all night. Uh, so I'm curious what, 
um, if you have, you know, a crystal ball, what um, you would say about where we are right now um, with this economic crisis? Uh, you know, right now, I think we're 8.2% um, at unemployment rates nationally. Um, and in New York, that rate is 12.5%. But in places that have struggled historically, um, like in the Bronx, where I live now, um, is more like 25%, uh, which is insanely high. Um, so are you concerned at all that this if we're not already in an economic crisis, which I, you know, technically, um, which, you know, no one can doubt that we really are. Um, but those effects have yet to be seen, really, um, since we've had so many kind of um, uh, thing, measures that they've tried to implement to, to stop the avalanche that's to come. Um, but are you are you afraid at all that this will lead to a rise in crime and exasperate the issue of mass incarceration and policing in general? I mean, th those are really weighty questions. I have to say, I think it's in general very difficult to predict where things are going to go. It's much easier to kind of tell a story about the past than it is to say anything interesting about the future. I kind of forswore prediction after I told my um, wife on election day in 2016 that she should stop worrying and just go to sleep and it'll all be fine. <laughs> I mean, not, not yeah. that it'll all be fine, but that we'll wake up with a <laughs> liberal Democrat in the White House. Um, so I don't, I, I think the best answer, the most honest answer I can give is that I'm not really sure about what's to come. What I would say is that, you know, this is a moment where we're sort of seeing a weak reprise of the politics of the 1960s in some way. Only in the sense, I guess, that we have like a law and order kind of rhetoric on the right. We don't have kind of social democratic rhetoric on the on the left or on the democratic left or whatever, but we do have kind of law and order talk on the right. My suggestion to the left would just be that we be comfortable about talking about crime and violence as a social problem relating, in fact, to the things that you've just mentioned in your question, right? The pervasive, mm -hmm. profound economic crisis that we're living through, even if it's, you know, even if it's as bad as it is today and it's not getting worse, it's really, really bad, right? So my suggestion is just that we be comfortable about talking about that as a social problem. We have the best analysis of it. I mean, it's the, the truth mm -hmm. is on our side and the recipe is not victim blaming and punitiveness, but actually an expanse, expansion of social policy and the welfare state, which is the kind of thing that we're primed to argue for. So that would sort of be how I would approach the future. But as to what exactly is gonna happen, I have no, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, okay, so I really hope that other people ask some of the hardball questions um, that I had developed. Um, but I don't want to take any more time. So I'm going to go to the stack. Um, and we have um, first a question from Lichi. Um, Lichi, I don't know if you want to say um, what your question, if you want to speak it yourself, or I'm happy to also to read it. Um, but let me know. This is uh, not Lychee. It's uh, Jonah. I'm Lychee. Lychee's here. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, you know, I asked in the chat about the uh, argument about the drug war and how much of it has to do with federalism and that it's people in federal prison. That's a, a minority of prisoners, but are more likely to be there for drugs. People in state prison are more likely to be there for other kinds of crimes. I, I also had a question to Donner. Thank you for the, the talk. Um, I, you know, and I don't know how much comparative, you know, research you've done, but I'm really interested, you know, there's an argument about the uniqueness of American criminal justice that has to do with white supremacy. And you're, you're kind of challenging it and you're saying, look, there was this moment in which the kind of inequality of American capitalism led to a rising crime, particularly violent crime, and there was a very punitive response and we're kind of living with the effects of that. I think there's another argument out there that yes, America is very violent because everyone has guns. And I'm wondering to what extent, you know, you found in your research that other countries that have, that are let more equal and have bigger welfare states and also have much lower levels of both violent crime and incarceration. I know I'm asking a lot here, but <laughs> to what extent can you explain the differences in crime violent crime in particular incarceration 
by the size of the welfare state and the redistributiveness of the welfare state. In other words, is it clear that a country like Denmark, it's gonna be much safer. You're gonna also have many, many fewer people in prison because they spend more on welfare and so are less unequal. Or the kind of liberal argument that, look, it's mm -hmm. just, they don't have guns. And so, you know, can you parse that out a little bit? Yeah, that's a great, Question. Shall I address quickly the issue about American federalism first, and then I'll try and address that sure. excellent question. The issue about American federalism is you're absolutely right. And if you read Michelle Alexander's book closely, you'll see that whenever she wants to talk about the high percentage of drug offenders in the prison population, she'll refer specifically to federal numbers. So it is entirely true that because the federal system is much smaller than the state system, that ends up being a little misleading. But the other thing to add to what you had observed is that it's also the case that the vast, vast majority of those people who are in federal prison for drug offenses are not the nonviolent drug offender of the standard story. They're not in prison because they possess weed or something like that. So that's also another weakness for the argument that this is all about the war on drugs in that sense. It's much more about the drug trade than about you, drug use or possession. Um, the other question, and I like, uh, I mean, what are the odds that a question that Jonah is asking has something to do with uh, mentions a Scandinavian country? Um, pretty high, I would guess. But so my answer to that, my answer to that question would be that two, I, I think I would emphasize two points. The first point is that if you look at comparisons of the rate of violent crime that doesn't involve guns, so if, if you look at not just homicides, but actually violent crime, there's some effort by actually David Soskich, who's a VFC uh, kind of so, uh, study, studies comparative political economy and Nicola Lacey, who was working on, who are working on this. And they've estimated levels of violent crime, non-gun violent crime, and shown that the disparities are actually quite similar to the disparities in homicide. That's one point. The other point is that I think one way of making sense of the, and this is, I think, something that I'm still definitely thinking through. But one way of making sense of the large number of guns in the American population is actually as a consequence of the weird way or the underdevelopment of American state authority over the course of the late 19th and early 20th century. And in that sense, the prevalence of guns is kind of a consequence rather than a cause of the big story of American economic and political development. In other words, guns aren't something that just sort of drop from on high. They're actually a response to the kind of complex of growing violence that we see and that is part of the story that we're trying to tell in the article. That was a great question, Jonah. Thank you. Um, okay, so next um, we have Jason's question um, about Black and Hispanic concentration in cities. Um, Jason, do you want to speak your question yourself or would you sure. like me to pose it? Okay. Go for sure. It. Uh, thank you, Adana, for a very uh, enlightening presentation. Um, to a certain extent, you already uh, answered this, uh, and forgive me if this is awkwardly phrased, but uh, wouldn't Black and Hispanic concentration in cities and as disproportionately poor people in cities be a main factor in explaining street crime? by poor Blacks and Hispanics? And if, as I assume is the case, white people are generally better off in urban areas, aren't they less, just less likely to be targeted by the police? Particularly since, as I think we all know, Black in the United States is generally a stand-in for poor and poor is a stand-in for criminal. So I think, I think that's actually, I think that's less of a question than an answer, Jason, in some ways. Like, you're absolutely right. I think another way of putting your point, the way that I would summarize it back to you, is to add something to the presentation that I gave, which is to say that the Racial Disparities in Crime Commission are in part a story of racial disparities in class position, but they're also in part a story about geography. It's the fact that African Americans are more likely and Hispanics are more likely to live in cities, as you were suggesting, and therefore that also is part of the story that these are, these are crime is mainly an urban problem. And so therefore that also partly explains the disparities. I think that's, that's a fair point. Thanks, Jason. Um, okay, so the next question or um, 
yeah, a question that we had posed in the chat was from Andy. Um, again, Andy, would you like to um, give your, your question yourself or I'd be happy to share it? Okay, no problem. So um, Andy uh, says that he'd love to hear some of what uh, you think a donor about uh, the way moving to move forward um, how, and how to create new systems. Um, so kind of a crystal ball question again, but um, <laughs> one that I think is fitting. <laughs> um, I think that's the million dollar question, Andy. I, don't, I wish I had a better answer for you than the answers that I tried to give, but I, I suppose I'll just re repeat more emphatically maybe what I was trying to say at the end, which is that I think the way forward, the way forward for us as socialists in particular is to bring the importance of penal policy into the conversation about how to change and dismantle mass incarceration and to bring in particular the idea that what we need to do is not spend less money everywhere, but actually spend much more money on people who are poor and oppressed in the United States. And that's something I think that is uniquely obvious to us as socialists, but is currently missing from what is being discussed in public about criminal justice reform. And I think there's a danger that the current criminal justice reform conversation will get, will get kind of drowned in the austerity environment that is coming, no doubt, in the next few years. And it's, as a consequence, I think very, very important that we do that, um, which sort of we're uniquely positioned to do, I think. Um, that's maybe like less of a, optimistic utopian answer to your utopian question, but that's what I think is our special obligation. Um, thank you for your question, Andy. I'm sure everyone was, was you know, thinking the same thing. So uh, next on stack, we have Michael Pollack. Hi, Donner. Um, first, I wanna say how much I, um, how great I think your article is. I think this is the third time I've read it. So I think it's just an archetype of how to deal with data, how to write, and how to do historical causality. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. <laughs> so I have one question. Well, it comes in the question of sort of how does this all apply to the defund the police movement? You are quite scathing about liberal solutions like bias training and hiring black policemen, but of course, the defund the police movement starts with the same premise that that's all crap. And in going back to your article, it seems to me that we're dealing with a 60 year period, basically 1960 to today, and that your article, your, your argument applies perfectly to the first 30 years of it. Hmm. Crime rises, it's a real rise, and there's sort of a functional substitute argument that we have incarceration instead of social democracy. But there's an inflection point. The high point of crime is 1991. And the crime, the violent crime rate, uniform reporting FBI is now half of that, but the prison population is twice of that. So even accepting your entire argument, it seems you could make an argument there's been a massive um, over-policing since then. <laughs> and if we cut the prison population in half, we'd have gotten back to the functional substitute. Essentially that all of the things that had been put in place, um, that three strikes, long uh, prison sentences, um, things that increased the prosecutor's power and the plea bargain situation, they're not crime cycle sensitive. They're all stay there until a great deal of force is put against them and that they're causing suffering unnecessarily. Not only that, in a certain sense, they are by your, by your own sort of argument extended, creating more crime. If crime is caused from social stress, um, stop and frisk is a kind of social stress. Being outraged at your dignity being offended is certainly something that leads to most violent outbreaks more than just being poor. That's about as far as my question goes, yeah. So well, that's a fantastic question, Michael, I think. And it, there are a lot of issues there. I'm not sure I'll be able to address all of them, but the basic point is one that I think everyone should think about and is a very important point, which is that you're absolutely right that the last 20 to 30 years have been years of crime decline in the United States while incarceration rates have continued to increase. And that poses a puzzle for an argument that says that crime and violence are really is, is a really important part of the story. 
One thing I would say, uh, there are a few things that I want to say. One thing that I would say is that you have to remember that the, as I was uh, arguing in the talk, that crime is a stock, crime is a flow while incarceration is a stock. So in part, what the high level of incarceration reflects is the number of people who were sent to prison earlier as crime was rising, who are still in prison because of the outrageously long sentences that we have. And also people who returned from being released when they violated one or another parole condition. That's also, that's part of the story. So that can be part of the reason for a disconnect between the two. But if I understand you correctly, you're also making the argument that we're at such an intensely high level of incarceration that in effect, we can afford to dramatically reduce, sen dramatically reduce sentences, dramatically reduce the incarceration rate without actually increasing crime. Um, and I think the reality is that that's actually very much true about incarceration. It's not clear that it's true about policing. So let me just try and explain what I mean by that, because that, that, that's a nuance that I hadn't really introduced in the presentation, but it's important in response to your question. Over the last 40 years, 30 years, the story of American mass incarceration is really a story not about increased and elevated policing. And this is going to sound really weird to people who are living in New York, because in New York, that is absolutely what happened. The level of policing went up really dramatically. In the United States, in general, though, the level of policing kind of increased slowly, gradually, incrementally. And it's really incarceration that increased very, very dramatically. So what the United States, in effect, did is it relied on prisons to manage crime rather than policing. And so I, I wish I had made some of these graphs, I could show them to you. But basically, even today, the United States has, if we look at the United States police per capita ratio, it's actually lower than the average developed country. The average developed country has about 250 to 300 police per 100,000 people and the US is around 215, which is very, very strange for people to hear because New York, again, this is an important point. New York is not that. New York is like a authoritarian dystopia and New York's police to person ratio is much, much higher. But so in that sense, it is entirely true about incarceration, what you're saying, that if we were to reduce the incarceration population, we actually might find that crime actually doesn't go up at all. But it's not so obvious about policing. And the reason that I am trying to emphasize this is because I don't want socialists to be in the position where our argument for reducing prison and reducing in, uh, policing hinges on the effect of policing on the crime rate, which is where criminal justice reformers all, almost always find themselves and is they're reliant on that empirical relation. And in fact, our argument is a moral one, irrespective of what it does to the crime rate. These are how, uh, this is how a good society would deal with high levels of crime differently with social policy. Could I follow that up slightly? Yes, please. Uh, okay. I think, yeah, I think that's okay. So since we moved on to policing, the, um, general demand for defund the police means really like shift the funding of the policing that essentially precisely because you said policing has taken on all these social work functions that we could offload them from the police to social workers so that for example mental health incidents should not be responded to by the police domestic disturbances should not be responded and in a less polarized um outfit, you could kind of see the police agreeing with this. This is not what they signed up to be policemen for. And we would all be better off if someone without a gun went to go those places. And you, you probably have no trouble, no problem with that sort of policy change, right? Yeah. Okay. That's totally. Right. I think that's absolutely yeah. right. I just think the, the point that I am uh, trying to get across is that it's absolutely the case that police shouldn't be doing these things in a good society. The only issue is that if all we did was take the money that we use right now, um, and spend on police to do these and move it to these other different bureaucratic arms to do the same policy, we're going to have pathetic social policy. In fact, oh, we're, we're, that's, that's the, that's the, yeah, that's the, the answer the, is still Medicare for all. I totally understand. Right, I'm just saying the, that in, in the absolute, you know, in, in the place where like the budget in New York, for example, where the police budget goes up a billion dollars, well, the crime, so it goes up 20%, well, the crime rate's still going down. That's a billion dollars that didn't need to be spent. If you move that billion to social workers that dealt with rousting the homeless or whatever, yeah. you're not making a utopia, but right. you're not costing any more money, less people are getting shot. No, I think, I think that's a great point, Michael. I, the only thing that I would say, and here I'll stop resisting, I'm just gonna make one more point, is that I think that's a program for New York that could work for New York. The problem is that 
New York is totally atypical. It's not a pro it's not a program for a Ferguson, Missouri. It's not a program for a St. Louis because these cities don't have the kind of revenue that New York has. I mean, New York's revenue is off the charts relative to other localities. So while New York can maybe move some money around and be okay, um, ultimately for Ferguson to be fixed, you need to tax San, San Francisco's billionaires and redistribute from there. And that's something that only we can do, we can only do with a massive national movement and federal program. Great answers, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks Michael for posing them. Um, so, okay, we have 10 minutes left to our um, event. I don't know, Adana, if you have any, if you have any wiggle room with staying on a little bit longer. Yeah, I totally we do. have a few questions. Okay. No, I totally um, do. And yeah, we maybe have, one thing, uh -huh. uh, Carissa, if I could suggest, I don't know if what, you've, what you think about this, but maybe one thing we could do is take two questions at a time. Would that be better? Uh, yeah, that might be good, actually. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think how we can uh, order this. Um, Lichi, if in the meantime, I'm I'm gonna call on the next person, but in the meantime, could you just type in a summary of your chat of your question so I can see how we can put them together with the other questions we have? Um, yeah, so we have a couple more uh, questions in the the stack. Um, I want to make sure we get to as many as as possible. Um, so we'll go a little bit over. Um, but the the next person is Courtney. Hey, um, okay, so I think you might have answered my, I actually have two questions. Uh, <laughs> so um, I, st I think I still want to ask both of them if that's okay, um, because I think they're both important. You kind of touched on it with Michael, my first question, um, but we haven't touched on my second question yet. So my first question is actually um, just a, um Kind of reiterate what Carissa said. I am one of her family members who was impacted by the criminal justice system, um, and it actually Im impacted me much uh, six years after the fact that I had my my offense. Um, in uh, in the way of me having a job and then finding out about the um, my criminal background and then firing me for it. Um, and so in that situation, I realized that, um, you know, all of the, the criminal justice reforms that we typically hear about of like uh, banning the box or um, lighter sentencing, things like that would have helped me, you know, of course, when I was intimately involved in the criminal justice system, but it didn't, it wouldn't have helped me after the fact. After the fact, what would have helped me is uh, at will policies, getting, mm -hmm. getting rid of at will, at will employment, right? Um, I'm actually, I work for a criminal justice organization now, and um, we're pretty hyper-localized, um, which is, you know, you argue that uh, the way that we got here was, was by, uh, you know, the, the 50, the story of the 50 states, right? It, and it being coming down to these uh, localities that are making these criminal justice um, laws. Um, I'm wondering if, if that is our way out. Like, uh, it doesn't sound like to me that that being hyper localized is the way out. Um, and even though I work in this field, like I, I'm trying to still be critical about the way that we're approaching this and not just stay, you know, within um, what we think the answer already is. Uh, so I'm curious to hear from you. Um, you. You talk about federal policies, which as socialists, we obviously all agree to tax the rich. Um, if I were to bring this up to my employer now, they would be like, that has nothing to do with criminal justice reform, right? Um, but I, I, I still wanna think about what are those policies that are actually outside of the criminal justice system that we could try to implement on a federal level? That's a, yeah, that's a fantastic question and point. That, were there, uh, Courtney, I might've missed the first question though. Were there two or is that? Oh, I didn't, I didn't, do you want me to ask the second one as well? Uh, or, Carissa, Carissa, you're the boss. Did I do I'm that? Happy. I will allow it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So then my second question is, um, so you also acknowledge that crime did indeed rise in the 60s um, and imply that the left kind of backs itself into a corner by censoring our positions on denying this crucial fact. 
even though the reason for doing so, it, it comes from good intentions uh, because we want to avoid uh, blaming the victim. Uh, but you argue that it's based in a kind of moralism that equates crime committed with bad person, which is a mistake. Um, so in your antidote, crime is an index of oppression. Uh, you seem to be inverting this sense of morality by saying that crime is actually a measure of the environment or society rather than being a measure of the man. Uh, so I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about this and why you say that this kind of moralism is a mistake for us on the left. Great. So uh, that second question was kind of like, you said it better than I could say it in some ways. So I, I, I don't really want to say too much about it, except to just kind of co-sign the way that you put it in the question, which is that what leftists should be comfortable arguing is that crime is an index of oppression and it's a symptom of a society gone into disrepair. It's a measure, as you were saying, a measure of, how did you put it? A measure of society, not a measure of man or something like that. I like that. That's, that's great. I, I, I don't want to try and say more than that because that's really well put. But with regards to the first question, I think you hit on something really profound, which I, which I didn't really address, which is that while local, local responses to the rise in crime were very much our way in to the problem that we are living through, to the era of mass incarceration, Local reforms, paradoxically maybe, local reforms cannot be our way out. And that's basically because what happened was local governments were responding to a, a failure ultimately, a failure of the American government at the federal level to redistribute, as I was saying, from rich places to poor places, from rich people to poor people. And local governments then basically handled the fallout from that with the punitive tools at their disposal as their electorate started to panic. The problem with fighting that at the, well, trying to reform that at the local level is that local governments don't have any of the tools that we as socialists would want to use to fix the deep social problems that mass incarceration is ultimately a symptom of. Local governments can't redistribute. I mean, this came up in the question that Michael was asking. New York is an exception, but if you look at any other local government, basically what happens if local governments start to tax people in their jurisdiction is that people jump they jump jurisdictional lines and leave local areas. On top of that, local governments actually institutionally and, and legally are kind of limited in the kind of redistribution they can do. So what we need is a national movement aiming at the federal government. Unfortunately, these days it feels really challenging to build that kind of thing, I think. And I don't want to gainsay how difficult that is. I mean, that is really, really difficult. But I think our unique obligation, and I'm sorry if I'm sounding like a broken record, but our unique obligation as socialists is to have that broad vision in our sights at all times. And that, in some ways, Courtney, I feel like your job is to convince your employer that they should take that seriously. That's ultimately what criminal justice reform as like successful social movement, I think, will have to look like. Do you have any policies in mind that I can push? <laughs> My well, but the, 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 <laughs> I think the thing here, I think Michael said it, Medicare for all is a great start. I think in general, social policies that can help build the broad coalition that is our job to build and that I think so many of you are trying to build, pushing those and, and, and explaining to people how those are connected to the problem of mass incarceration, that's kind of our unique obligation, I think. Thank you for that. Yeah, so go make that um, that push tomorrow. <laughs> um, you have a living room, uh, you know, pull out couch here in New York if you fail at that. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, okay, so we have a few more questions. Um, uh, we have two major questions actually from uh, Charlie and from Lucci. Um, so Charlie's is a little bit more technical about um, the money spent on social programs. Um, I will let him explicate what his, his question is. And then um, uh, Lichy's is much more political. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. But first, um, let me uh, go to Hakan, who I accidentally skipped earlier. Um, he just he wrote back in in the chat and I just completely missed his name. So um, Hakan, if you want to go ahead and raise yeah, your question. Thank you. thank you for bringing me back. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I had two questions. So first one had to do with 
how you talk about crime. So for example, you, ju you just talked about crime as an index of oppression, which I think would be a useful definition for socialists. But on the other hand, uh, I think it's important, like one thing that I think the article didn't point out when it talks about crime and violence is how our perception of crime and violence is biased uh, in the way that, for example, it's a crime to kill one person, one civilian to kill another. That's not a crime to, for a police officer to kill a civilian, or it's not a crime for to start a war. It's not a crime to exploit labor and so on. So I think that's one criticism that I had that, you know, that nuance should be a part of the discussion when we're talking about crime. And then the other thing that I had a question about is the military. So you talked about how federal uh, budgets are not a part of, for example, don't spend as much in terms of like they spend way more on welfare and social spending as opposed to, you know, policing and uh, judges and so on. But the federal budget on the federal level, they wouldn't spend it on policing, they would spend it on the military or the National Guard and Department of Homeland Security and so on. And there is this proportionate spending of, uh, you know, I mean, what is it like five, six percent of the federal budget is the military. And so in that sense, uh, I think that's also another point to like another thing that's important to point out, like Bernie Sanders, for example, proposed a 10 percent cut to the military and defunding the military uh, could be the f part of the federal solution to uh, what you're saying, at least. Or what, what do you think? about that? I, I, I assume you would agree. <laughs> Yeah, both are great questions, uh, uh, Hakan. I would say, so with regards to the first, I think in some sense, this is a terminological issue. And in some sense, it's actually an important substantive issue. The sense in which it's a terminological issue is that I'm perfectly happy with you to call those things crimes. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to call, I mean, in fact, I would demand that we call the war in Iraq a crime. Or I would demand that we would call insider trading a crime, all kinds of white collar crime goes ignored as well as you're, as you're saying. And in that sense, that, that stuff is actually economically much more harmful than most, most of the robbery that goes on in the United States, the amount of money stolen. In the, but in another sense, it's a substantive issue that's important, which is that, that those kinds of crimes are not the kinds of crimes that in general, the American public tends to panic about, right? When the American public panicked in the early 1990s, it was not panicking about what, I don't know, I don't remember when Enron was, but Enron, maybe Enron was late 90s or whatever, but it wasn't panicking about Wall Street executives committing crime. And they're never, they weren't panicking about the Gulf War. They were panicking about ordinary street and violent crime. So if that's what we're out to explain, I think it's defensible to talk about crime as a category that is um, a little bit more narrow than the category that you were proposing. The second question that you asked was about the military, and I think that's a perfectly uh, legitimate point. So I, if I remember right, the U.S. spends roughly, I think, like a trillion dollars a year on the military at the federal level. So if we were just fantasize for a second, Hakan, and say we're going to abolish police, prisons, and the military, um, and courts, we're going to generate roughly about $1.3 trillion, right? $1.3 trillion will close about 50% of the gap between the United States and social democracies in Europe, which is good, right? 50% of the gap is good. And remember, this is like pretty utopian. We've abolished the military, abolished prisons, abolished. Um, but even then we have something left to do. And there's a, a lot of good work now on how regressive and how anemic the American tax structure is and how little we tax the rich and redistribute to the poor. So I think at, at least what I'm saying to you is that part of the solution will have to be focusing on that problem of revenue as well as moving revenue around. But of course, I think if you can get popular support for it, try and abolish or try and cut the military as well. Um, but alongside, you have to try and cultivate popular support, which there is popular support for, for taxing the rich and redistributing the poor. Great question, Um So there, I mean, I don't want to butcher uh, these two really great questions from Charlie and uh, Lychee, so I'm going to let you guys um, just, you know, give them yourself. Um, but just to, out of, you know, consideration for time, uh, just, I guess, read what you wrote to try to cut down. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll just we'll see where we go from there. So um, Charlie was on stack first and then Lychee. Hey, uh, okay, so I'll read this 
All right, so I understand that much more money is spent on social programs than is spent on incarceration, and your graphs were really eye-opening for understanding how big that discrepancy is, but I don't necessarily think it follows that incarceration is cheaper than social pro uh, programs. So I was wondering, well, first, uh, I didn't put this in here, but just about the distinction between the word like easier and cheaper or less expensive, because I get your historical argument that, and structural argument that you know, it's very difficult for municipalities to redistribute wealth. Um, and if the federal government's unwilling to do it, well, the uh, easiest thing for a municipality to do to address crime would be to um, enact incarceration, right? Um, right. But I was wondering, like, is there um, empirical evidence for um, whether it's actually cheaper, which I think is a different question, right? So um, is there a difference between how crime rates are affected by changes in comparable spending amounts between social democracies and the US um, that would demonstrate that the social democratic approach is cheaper, meaning more effective per dollar spent than the penal approach? I see, that's a great question. So if I can just summarize, Charlie, to just make sure that I've understood your question, what you're asking is whether per, let's say like hypothetically per crime averted is social policy actually more expensive than incarceration. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, um, so there's a very nice paper on this subject actually by a man named John Donahue and if you email me, I can send it to you and he tries to estimate exactly this. The reason that in the end he showed, that the way in which he ends up showing that social policy is in fact much, much more expensive relates to one point that I made and then is also a little bit uh, more complicated and maybe the more complicated part we can leave for the discussion. But the reason that it's basically much more expensive is because you cannot target social policy in the way that you can target penal policy. So that partly has to do with what's politically feasible. Like, so what he ends up in the article showing is that in effect, if you could target social policy just to young male delinquents, it would be feasible maybe to argue that social policy is cheaper. But imagine trying to push social policy by targeting it in that hyper-targeted way. It's politically just not possible. And so in, in a sense, when you're comparing politically feasible social policy to politically feasible penal policy, political fe feasible penal policy ends up being much, much more inexpensive. Um, just because basically social policy of that kind, the idea that you would basically in effect, the idea is you wait for someone to commit a crime and then you shower them with social policy. I mean, socialists may want to argue that that's a really important thing to do, but that's not politically something that was ever feasible in the United States. And therefore, penal policy ends up being much cheaper, as you were saying, for municipalities and government in general. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, sure, great question. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for your question, Charlie. Um, and then Lychee, um asks a very important political question. Um, so I want to give her a chance to um, say it if, if you'd like, Lychee. And this, this time it's the real Lychee. <laughs> 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 the fake Lychee's drinking a beer right now. Um, I um, thanks to Donner and thanks to the to the low man Polly Ed um, working group for putting this on. I was looking forward to it for the past couple of weeks. I've read a Donner's piece a couple of times. Um, and I think it's really, really important for people who are, you know, grappling with this question um, of, you know, how do we actually live in a different kind of a society uh, where there's no crime and where there's not a punitive response to everything. So I think that's ultimately what we want. Um, and I think the way, I, I think what's so incredible about the piece is that it upends the way that we've thought about it before, which is that it's all not been true that um, crime is the reason that there was a spike in um, uh, incarceration rates um, and that actually most people who are in prison are there um, either because they're innocent or for low level crimes. Um, and I think dealing with the fact that actually there was an increase in crimes and dealing with the fact that there have been, there's been a punitive response um, to actual crimes that hurt other people um, is, is something that the left has to grapple with, I guess is just the way that I would put it. And so, um, and, and I, 
And I worry sometimes that we, we don't do that and we kind of hand wave those questions away and are dismissive of it. I'm sorry, this is not what I wrote, but it's kind of in there. Um, and, and I think that people see these movements explode against police and then think, oh, there's a movement against the police um, therefore, everyone wants to abolish the police. Uh, I, I know I'm being um, a little bit facetious, but uh, just to say, like, what, what do you do as a movement when those, um, those things change? That is, people's support or non-support for the police historically goes up and down. Um, you know, there are obviously moments where it's very low, and then there's moments where it's high. Um, and then like, so what does that mean? For, how does a political organization respond um, to, the, to both going with these movements that are tr that's trying to do something, but also not alienating ourselves from people who actually do deal with high crime rates and it doesn't make sense to them when, um, when, some, when someone says abolish the police. Um, and especially when we don't have an alternative, right? Because um, you know, if something bad happens to you, you can either do nothing, I guess, um, or you call the police. That's just what more, most working class and poor people do. And we can say, don't call the police, but then we don't have anything in response. And so mm -hmm. that gap, I think, is such a complicated thing mm -hmm. for a political organization. And so I, I don't expect you to answer that, but I, <laughs> I think that's a thing to grapple with or something. But thank you so much, um, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Lizzie. That's a great question. And you're absolutely right that I don't have an answer to that, that which you put really nicely, that that challenge, that imperative, like of walking these two imperatives at the same time. I suppose the only thing that I would say, which may or may not be helpful, is that I think socialists should in part, and this is really easy for me to say as a armchair socialist and not as an organizer, so please forgive me, but I think socialists should feel a little less the impulse to be to immediately solve the problems of American political economy tomorrow, right? I think in some ways, the what what socialists have to convince um, this movement, and what in general, we have to be comfortable with, is that this is a really long term struggle. This is a long term struggle to build a mass working class movement for justice in the United States. And in some ways, the debates that we end up having about how can we fix this tomorrow are so, in some ways a distraction from the big task that we have, which is to build that movement. And I think the truth is, in some ways, like the injustice of the situation that we find ourselves in is precisely the trap that you've documented. It's precisely the fact that there is no solution tomorrow, given all of these problems. And our, our, our sites as socialists, I think, and again, this is kind of the broken record part of the presentation, I think our, site, our sites as socialists have to be set on that big ambition because there's no one else who's going to do that in this country. Yeah, thanks for the question, Lee Chi. Um, I, I, so we'll end with just one more question, which I think is a pretty good follow-up from Lee Chi um, and a good way to close. Um, and it's a follow-up question from Andy. Um, Andy, I don't know if your mic is working now and you want to give your question, but I'm happy to read it as well. You just want to type in the chat. He doesn't um, he's on the call anymore. But oh, he's not in. Okay. Okay. That's fine. So um, Andy's question, I think, has, has something to do with, you know, vision. Like, what can we, um, what is our vision as socialists for the kind of society that we hope to see? Um, and I mean, I, th I think it's, you know, it's a hard question to answer. Um, it's an, another one of those crystal ball questions that I'm throwing at you, so I'm sorry, but, um, but I think it's really important because um, when you really dig into the prevailing narrative about um, criminal justice and um, the role of, of racism as playing this kind of trans-historical um, role in uh, mass incarceration, it feels hopeless. You know, there, there's like a deep cynicism there um, that makes it, um, that leaves one feeling like there's no way we can actually fix this. Like this problem is gonna be with us forever because it existed, you know, at the beginning. Um, and it, you know, has, has stayed with us for the, you know, couple hundred years that we've existed as, as a country. 
Um, and so his question is um, when he's, you know, thinking about like what a system looks like that dismantles the current uh, prison or policing system um, beyond just saying or arguing that um, this problem is big and it's a systemic problem. Um, how uh, he asked, how do I describe this systemic? Um, what is our utopian vision here that we can use as like a adrenaline shot for ourselves as, as organizers trying to build a better world? Um, that would be, out, uh, you know, also convincing for people who um, understandably have a bit of cynicism of, for uh, a better world that we can build together. Yeah, wow, what a question. So he's asking for a utopian vision for cynics. <laughs> Um, I would yeah. say, uh, uh, I would say there, <laughs> I, I would say there's no way around a big systemic solution to a big systemic problem. So he's saying, what do I say beyond arguing it's just a big systemic problem? So what I would say is beyond arguing it's just a big systemic problem, outline your big systemic solution. Your big systemic solution is the socialist future. And with regards to criminal justice, I think the socialist future has two components, right? One component is the social policy component that we've been talking about. People should not have to worry about jobs, not have to worry about healthcare, not have to worry about schooling, all these kinds of things that we worry about in our current society. Your big systemic solution is that we wouldn't have to worry about those things. And I think, you know, that, that is a utopian vision that people can convince people, that can compel people. I mean, that's the history of our movement. The other aspect of this that I guess we didn't speak so much about is what a socialist vision of criminal justice specifically would look like when people do say commit acts of violence against other people. How do we think about the socialist response to that problem. I think my own view is that this is where we should look cross nationally for some inspiration, not necessarily for models, but for some inspiration. I mean, the way that, for instance, a country like Norway handles imprisonment. Yes, I know it's not a socialist paradise. There are problems in Norway, but the way that it deals with criminal justice is actually remarkably progressive in some sense. And specifically, they spend, I think the estimate that I saw is that they spend something like a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars per prisoner per year on incarcerating that person and retraining them and retraining them to get a job, re-enter the economy. In other words, the 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 ruling philosophy there is that we ought to we ought to do everything we can to reintegrate this person into society as a flourishing member of that society and i think we can learn a lot from that because it's very different from the punitive ethic that governs american mass incarceration which is the idea that we sort of consign these people to these institutions lock up the cell and throw away the key right that 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 ethic i think is not um, it's actually surprisingly and, and disconcertingly common in the United States, but there are other models out there. So I would say we combine a kind of socialist vision for the world with a, a socialist vision for the criminal justice system specifically. And that's the utopian vision that I would say Andy needs to convince his cynics. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That, and that's, a, that's a good place for us to end for tonight. Um, uh, thank you so much, Adoner. Um, we really appreciate you being willing to come out to give, or not come out, you know, you, just, <laughs> you didn't leave your house, but <laughs> um, for hopping on this Zoom call um, and uh, agreeing to have this talk that could potentially be, you know, pretty contentious in uh, DSA space um, and being so open with like really engaging with the intellectual conundrums here. Um, you know, no, no one of us have the solution. Um, and if we did have the solution, if it was that easy that, you know, we can just take one narrative and actually fix the problem, then it would be fixed by now. Um, so, you know, I hope that this can start a um, more rich, uh, healthier kind of uh, intellectual culture within DSA for us to actually talk about these hot button um, issues. Um, and I really appreciate you for um, opening up that door. Um, Thanks, Carissa. And thank you, everyone, for coming. I really enjoyed meeting you. And uh, or if this counts, <laughs> I really enjoyed seeing you. And I <laughs> hope we can do it in person sometime soon. <laughs>
Absolutely. Um, and we, you know, th this is a political education group, but we implore everyone here to be as involved in the organizing as possible. Um, you know, be, you know, actually live out the other mandate of, of Marx to not just, um, you know, understand the world, but actually go out to change the world.